Hi, I put up a video a little while back uh, giving general advice on applying to Oxford or Cambridge and as a result of that I actually had quite a few people contact me, loads of people were asking about uh, tips on applying, about interviews. One thing that came up a lot was people asking me for my interview questions. I thought I'd go through each of my interviews, each of the questions and break down the what they're asking, how I answered it and in most cases how I should have answered it. This is naturally going to be a really physics based video but what I wanted to do was just work through what interviews like, give an account of how interviews pan out, the kind of questions you can expect. And it is portable across to a lot of other subjects. So I hope that people find this useful. Interview 1. Now I should clarify that I applied to Jesus College. And uh, the first interview I had was on the day I arrived, which was my physics-based interview. I had three interviews at Jesus. One was physics, one was math, and one was meant to be an experimental based one, but I'll well, deal with that in a sec. The first question that they asked me was, I just sat down and they kind of weren't really listening to what I said, but they just asked, why in physics, why here, and you know, give a general account of what I've always wanted to do, the kind of stock answer, I suppose. Um, and in a way, they're kind of like good cop, bad cop. One interviewer didn't appear very interested, the other kind of jumped on one thing I said, I said I wanted to be an astronaut. And he said, why don't you just be a pilot? And like, it was quite aggressive from the off. The first main question they asked me was, how can we tell that there are planets around distant stars? Um, to which I replied that you can see a gravitational wobble, the star moves in its orbit. What causes that wobble? The answer being that when you have two bodies orbiting each other, uh, like the Earth and the Sun, the Earth doesn't actually go around the centre of the Sun, they go around the centre of mass of the system. So it's somewhere very close to the centre of the Sun. As a result of that, the Sun um, is rotating about a point that's not its centre, so it's going to have a slight change like that if you view it from one side. The next question was, why can't we see these planets through a telescope? And the kind of obvious answer is that the planets are very small and space is really, really, really big. That led on to the last question they asked me, which is, why do we increase the size of the mirror in a telescope? I gave the answer that you increase the mirror because that allows you to take in more light Obviously, the more light you can get from something that's far away, the more you can tell what it is. What they really pushed me on, and I struggled to get until the very end, was that, it's the, that any image that's formed by a telescope, because it's essentially just a long tube, it's going to be diffraction limited. You're going to get diffraction around the edge of the telescope. So if you increase the mirror size, then you're going to get less diffraction, because you've got a wider aperture. For the last question, they showed me in this picture which shows two uh, beakers, one of which is cylindrical and one of which is conical, and they're on a seesaw, equidistant from the fulcrum, so they're both the same distance. The idea is they both have the same cross-sectional area on the bottom, and they're both filled to the same height of water. So, they asked me which one, which side of the seesaw goes down, and obviously I said, well, this side because there's more water, this side has less volume. I said, right, okay. And one of the professors said to me, right, I'm going to tell you a different idea. If force is pressure times area, and they both have the same cross-sectional area, and they both have the same level of water, which means the pressure is the same at the bottom, that should mean that they're balanced. But you just told me that one side's going to go down. So, are you right or am I right? And I had to think for a while about that one. But the correct answer is that the reason this side does go down is because on this side you have a vertical component of the normal force on the beaker. So you have the normal force going like this. And that's not horizontal. You have a small component that's vertical. And then the net force resulting from that counteract the same pressure acting down. So because this side doesn't have doesn't have that acting up, that side topples down. And then the last question they asked me was um, how would you demonstrate that you had a vertical component with in a classroom which is basic tools? And they wanted me to say, and I didn't say it, that you could use a drill. If you drill a hole in then you'd have the water wouldn't just go out horizontally, it would come up a bit as well. Interview two
Um, I sort of lucked out on interview two because it was meant to be based on uh, your experimental logbook, which I didn't keep at school. We didn't write everything we did in the experiments down, we just did it on scraps of paper. Uh, and as soon as I mentioned that in the preliminary meeting we all had together, the applicants, everyone's like, so it doesn't really look good from the off, but instead of that they did an interview just based on my personal statement, which was good because it meant I could place a lot of strengths that I have that isn't in physics, like um, where I did my work experience, um, sporting, public speaking, that kind of thing. But it was bad in the sense that I really didn't uh, have that experience in experimentation, which I thought I had. And as it turns out, the person who interviewed me is actually one of the people who's in charge of doing his practical course. So. Other people who did have the interview based on their experiments were asked, um, what was your favourite experiment that you've done? Can you recall uh, a particular experiment and talk us through how you did it? One person I think was asked, how would you establish the standing wave pattern in a clarinet? And I have no idea how that fits in with anything.